right. Well, we're continuing our sermon series called Belief in the Age of Skepticism, the age we live in. And if you're visiting with us today, welcome, but you are kind of coming in in part six of a movie. So I thought it would be a good idea to review from whence we have come. Uh, we started a long time ago with week one. Pastor Bob talked about, is it okay to have doubts? Remember, he talked about three categories of doubt, intellectual doubt, emotional doubt, and volitional doubt. And we talked about creating a safe atmosphere to process tough questions here at our church. Week two, we asked the first big question, is there evidence for a creator? And we saw that the answer is yes, uh, there is evidence of intelligent design. And then we went on to week three to talk about a more philosophical question, not just are we designed, but what are we designed for? Is there meaning and is there purpose? And so Pastor Bob talked about that from Ecclesiastes chapter one. Week four, uh, together, Pastor Bob and I did a co-teaching message on do we need God for morals? Now, it may not be totally obvious to you the connection between week three and week four, so let me explain that to you. Once you uncover what you're designed for, then you know what's right and wrong. And until then, you really don't know what's right and wrong. So if you see somebody trying to put waffle mix in a coffee maker, you're gonna go, let me explain. Uh, that's not what that's used for. That's the wrong way to do it. And so it's, it's our purpose that sort of drives our understanding of morality as well, if that makes sense to you. Then, last week, we had a guest speaker, Dr. Mark Yarhouse, who drilled down on one specific ethical issue and gave us a posture uh, that we need to take towards those in the LGBT community. Although our belief about marriage uh, is firm, and we may have gotten that right, uh, what he continued to um, encourage us to do is come at that issue with what he called convicted civility um, with compassion. And so we appreciated his um, contribution to our series. And so now we come to today's question, can we trust the Bible? Not a very controversial topic today, so it should be a good sermon. Let's pray, and then let's uh, get into God's Word. Heavenly Father, we bow before you, and we ask for your help. Open up our eyes and our ears and our minds, and most of all, our hearts. We want to see you in your Word today, and so help us from anything that would, can prevent us from hearing from you. We ask that you'd remove that from our path. And then as we leave today, if there is anything that would prevent us from obeying you, we ask that you'd take that out of the way as a stumbling block as well. We want to honor you and glorify you. Be with us in our time. Make your word rich and real. For Christ's sake, I pray. Amen. Back in the year 1999, a visiting preacher named Reverend Mark Craig was giving a sermon at the United Methodist Church in Austin, Texas, just after the second inauguration of then Governor George W. Bush. The Bush family was in attendance that morning, occupying the first three rows. Reverend Craig, knowing the occasion that morning, preached a sermon on the life of Moses. In that sermon, he drew this conclusion, quote, it is not enough to have an ethical compass to know right from wrong. America needs leaders who have the moral courage to do what is right for the right reason. It's not always easy or convenient for leaders to step forward. Even Moses had doubts. In David Aikman's book, A Man of Faith, George Bush made this comment about that sermon. Quote, the sermon spoke straight to my heart and my life. It seemed the pastor was challenging me to do more. I've heard powerful sermons, inspiring sermons, and a few too many boring sermons. <laughs> I preached some of those. But this sermon reached out and grabbed me and changed my life. Aikman summarizes, what George W. Bush believes happened during Reverend Mark Craig's sermon was that the Almighty was speaking through the pastor to encourage him to run for the presidency of the United States. Whoa. Brothers and sisters, my point this morning is not a political one whatsoever. The point I'm trying to make is simply this. It is a forgotten sub-point of history that George W. Bush's decision to run for president is attributed to a sermon delivered in the setting of a local church where he listened to a pastor proclaim the word of God. In other words, when this book was read, he believed God was speaking directly to him. This book makes an astonishing claim, and the claim is that God can be found when you read these pages. That's an amazing claim if you think about it. And many people today have trouble with that claim. 
Uh, there's been a huge shift in our country on this issue. In their book, Good Faith, Gabe Lyons and David Kinneman state in their research that among those age 18 to 31, fewer than half believe the Bible is their authority. Compare that to the older generation of 70 plus, where three out of four believe the Bible was their authority. Those in the younger age bracket described the Bible as, quote, just a story, unquote. 38% of them said it was just, quote, mythology, unquote. And 30% said it was, quote, a fairy tale, unquote. Some people say, how can I believe in this book? It records all these ancient events by goat herders, events which we can't verify. Only stupid, suggestible, suggestible naive people believe in that. And since I'm not one of those, I'm not going to believe the Bible. Or someone else says, what about all the other holy books out there? The Koran, the Vedas, the Book of Mormon. There's all these competing sacred books. How do I know which one is the right one? Or someone else says, the Bible, that's a tool of oppression. It's basically been used as a stick by the higher-ups in our society to oppress people who aren't powerful because it's really all about empire and domination. It's taught in a lot of schools today. Maybe you're here today and you've heard those thoughts or those questions and, and you're wrestling with those. If so, this message is for you. The question on the table today is, can we trust the Bible? Can we trust the Bible? That's such an important question. There was a time in my life 20 years ago where I had serious doubts about this book. And after doing what has been really 20 years of study, I've come to some very firm conclusions about this book, and I want to give you six reasons why you should trust the Bible. Six reasons why we can believe the scriptures. So let's just get right into it. Reason number one I'll put on the screen. Why trust the Bible? Because the Bible contains predictive prophecy which has been fulfilled. Let's say that together. The Bible contains predictive prophecy which has been fulfilled. If this book was just a book written by people, then it would not contain so many fulfilled prophecies. Yet on many occasions, the Bible predicts the future, years, decades, sometimes hundreds of years in advance. For example, the prophet Jeremiah predicted the destruction of the ancient capital city of Babylon, the mightiest city in the world at that time. That would be like somebody today predicting the destruction of Washington, D.C. That's a pretty bold prediction. But yet, that's what the prophet said would happen. Babylon would be destroyed. It would be uninhabited. And then to everyone's shock... This came true. We learned here last summer through the prophet Daniel who wrote around 500 BC that he was able to predict the next four coming world empires, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome. He predicted many other things that he dreamed about in advance and all of them came true. One of the most detailed prophecies is written by the prophet Isaiah. He predicted the name of a coming ruler who would let the Jews go back from captivity. He said his name would be Cyrus, long before Cyrus was ever born. The most extravagant prophecies in the Bible are those that are fulfilled perfectly by the person of Jesus Christ. I'll talk about that in another week, but just compare that, for example, with some of the other sacred books out there. The Quran contains one vague prediction that one day Islam will take over the world. Other than that, there are no significant prophecies in that book. Yet the Bible has literally hundreds of prophecies, and we have to wrestle with the fact that there's something supernatural going on with this book. Point number two. Point number two is this. The Bible claims to be the Word of God. Now, let's just say that together. The Bible claims to be the Word of God. The Bible does not claim to be just another book written by people. The Bible claims divine origin. Now, some people say, Pastor Dave, that's circular reasoning. It's reasoning. You're, you're appealing to the Bible to approve the Bible. That's not actually fair. First of all, everyone, anyone who appeals to an absolute authority has to at some point become circular. Some people approve, appeal to their senses to prove their senses. Some people appeal to their reason to prove their reason. All appeals to an absolute authority at some point become circular. The point I'm trying to make here is that the claim we need to wrestle with about this book is that it's not just a source of inspiration. It's not just a, a guidebook. This book makes an astounding claim about itself. It claims to be 
the Word of God. Take a look at 2 Timothy chapter 3. All Scripture is inspired by God. First, notice the word all. Second, notice the word inspired. That's not like how an artist is inspired to paint a painting or how a writer is inspired to write a poem. The word literally means God breathed. The Bible claims to be the word of God. In the Old Testament, there's so many examples that say this, that the word of the Lord came to the prophet so-and-so, or thus says the Lord. There's so many times that the Bible does this, I just want to point out one particular person. The person who has the clearest uh, description about the Bible being the word of God is Jesus Christ. Some people say, yeah, I like Jesus, but I'm not too sure about the Bible. Let me just encourage you that that is a very inconsistent position. You need to realize Jesus had a very high view of the scriptures. He said not one jot, not one tittle would, would ever pass away. He said things like in John 17, thy word is truth. Or he said in John 10, the scriptures cannot be broken. So here's the question I would ask. If you like Jesus, do you hold Jesus' view of the scripture? In Matthew 22, there's this story about Jesus answering a question from the Sadducees. They didn't believe in the resurrection, that's why they're so Sadducee. And they said, hey Jesus, there's this woman and she had seven different husbands. If there really is a resurrection, then which one of them is gonna be her husband in heaven? Notice Jesus' response. He says, you are in error because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God. And then he goes on to say, have you not read what God spoke to you? And then he goes on to explain. But I want you to notice here his words. He says, have you not read, not what God wrote, but have you not read what God spoke to you? That's incredible. What he's doing here is he's holding them accountable to what had been written as if God had spoken directly to them. And the words he appeals to were written 1,400 years earlier. You can't tell me Jesus didn't believe in the preservation and the inspiration of the scripture. You can't give me a scintilla of evidence that he ever questioned one word. You know why? It's because of who we believe Jesus is. We believe Jesus is the second person of the divine trinity. He wrote it. You see, Matthew chapter 24 records Jesus as saying this, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Jesus believed this book was not a human book. He taught that this book was indeed inspired. That's clear regarding the Old Testament. Some people say, well, what about the New Testament, though? Well, Jesus promised his disciples in John chapter 16 that the Holy Spirit would come upon them, and he would speak through them, and he would relay to them further teaching that Jesus wanted his church to have. That's exactly what happened. And so when Paul writes... He says, I am speaking with the authority of God. And so we see Paul quotes Luke as scripture. And then Luke quotes Matthew as scripture. And then Jude quotes Peter as scripture. And then look at what Peter says about the apostle Paul's writings. He says this at the end of his second epistle. His, meaning Paul's letters, contain some things that are hard to understand. And we all said, Amen. Yes, Paul's letters contain some things that are hard to understand. That's true. Which ignorant and unstable people distort as they do the other, what? Scriptures. Do you see how he's putting Paul on par and at the same level as the other scriptures there? That's the claim. The Bible claims to be the word of God. And sometimes people come into my office and they say, Pastor Dave, you know, I'm really hurting because somebody said something to me. It was quite careless and quite insensitive, and then they tell me what it was. And, and oftentimes, my advice to that person is just three words. Consider the source. Consider the source. Meaning this, you don't have to give that person the kind of authority you are giving them over you. They don't have to have that kind of power over you. Consider the source. Friends, the point I'm trying to make here about the scriptures is that point as well. Consider the source. Look at the words of 2 Peter chapter 1. 
For prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Consider the source. Next point. The next reason why we should trust the Scriptures is this. The Bible contains a coherent, cross-cultural message of spiritual liberation. I'm sorry for the tongue twister. I couldn't say that any shorter. So let's just say it together so we got it. Ready? The Bible contains a coherent, cross-cultural message of spiritual liberation. Good. The Bible's not just a book. It's not just one book. It's a collection of books, 66 books to be exact. And it was written over a period of time of about 1,500 years across multiple generations. It involves three different languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and, and Greek. And it was written on three different continents, Africa, Europe, and Asia. The Bible is a collection of books written by a variety of different authors. Some books were written by those who were very influential, kings and diplomats. But other books, they're written by poor people, like fishermen and average day laborers. People like Amos, who was a fig picker. There are 40 different authors all different walks of life. But it's amazing to me how unified and coherent the message of the whole Bible still is. Do you know how difficult it is to get religious people to agree on anything? Here we have these 40 different authors, and they're all telling the same amazing, coherent story, which has agreement in all of its parts. There's this consistent narrative about our God the creator and the redeemer of his people through the Messiah, all for his glory. There's a wholeness about the Bible, which I believe testifies not only to its uniqueness, but also to the fact that this is not just Victor's history. This is not a tool that was put together by the powerful because its authors come from all these different socioeconomic backgrounds. If you actually read this book, you'll know how often it rebukes those at the very top of our society. You'll know how often it actually encourages those at the low level of our society to, at times, engage in civil disobedience. It speaks to those in the high point. It speaks to those in the low end. It speaks to those in the middle. It has a cross-cultural message. It's really quite remarkable. Yet people say, well, how can you really believe this book? The, the morals in here, they're, they're just culturally regressive. Uh, they teach things that are, that are better left behind now. And oftentimes, when people bring up this objection, what they're speaking about is the issue of slavery. They say, you know, in Ephesians 6, it says, slaves, obey your masters. How can we believe in the Bible if it condones slavery? Well, first of all, when you and I see the word slavery, you and I immediately think of 19th century American race-based slavery which started with human trafficking, kidnapping, and always was slavery for life. That's really not what the scripture is talking about when it indicates any passages that have to do with slavery. Now, first of all, I think we can all agree that slavery in our country was an egregious sin in our nation's history. It was wrong, terrible, awful. It was a great injustice and very displeasing to God. But that's not what the Bible's talking about. Slavery in the Bible was really a form of indentured servanthood. It was kind of a last resort you could choose if you were in a lot of financial trouble. Instead of chapter 13, in those days, you could sell yourself into slavery, and it was kind of like the ancient version of bankruptcy. And so slaves, they were not segregated from society like we did here in America. And from a financial point, uh, standpoint, slaves often made the same wages as a free person, and during their time of service, they could gain quite a bit of capital for themselves, to the point where most of them could buy themselves out, and very few first century slaves were ever slaves for life. Most of them were expected to receive their manumission papers within 10 years or so. That's a very different concept. Now, was that system misused at times? I would be willing to concede, yes, as all human systems are. Secondly, was the Bible misused to condone 19th century race-based slavery? Again, yes. But those who did that were perverting the Bible. They were not properly using it. And that makes all the difference in the world. After all, if this is such an oppressive book, why 50 years ago when Dr. Martin Luther King 
led the charge against segregation and stood up against systemic racism in this country, why did he not throw out the Bible? Why did he appeal to passages such as in Amos chapter 5 and say, let justice roll down like the waters and righteousness like a mighty stream? He's appealing to the ethics of the scriptures. He's quoting one of the prophets. Now, I know this is a difficult issue, but before you just reject the Bible because of one thing you heard in your religion 101 class, please just consider that it might not be teaching what you've been told it's teaching. Which leads me to the next point. Point number four is this. The Bible has stood the test of time. Let's say that together. The Bible has stood the test of time. There is no literary source from the ancient world that has been submitted to more scientific and rigorous scrutiny and analysis like the Bible. Theologian Bernard Ram said, no other book has been so chopped, knifed, sifted, scrutinized, and vilified. A thousand times over, the death knell of the Bible has been sounded, the funeral procession formed, the inscription cut on the tombstone, and the committal read. But somehow, the corpse never stays put. Unlike the Yankees this week, if the Bible was a sports team, it would be undefeated for the last 2,000 years. In the year 300 AD, the Christian faith began to grow, and the Roman emperor Diocletian issued a decree to destroy Christians, and all of their books were to be burned. He failed. In fact, shortly thereafter, the Roman Empire soon adopted the very faith they were trying to destroy as Christianity brought Rome to its knees. This happened again and again and again. In 1700, Voltaire said, quote, within 100 years, the Bible and Christianity will be swept out of existence. In 1752, Voltaire was swept out of existence. And 50 years later, the Geneva Bible Society moved into his home and set up shop there as a place to print the Bible. It's kind of ironic. In 1870, General Lew Wallace, the governor of Indiana after the Civil War, set out to write a book against the Bible. And in the process, he became a committed Christian. He went on to write the second best-selling book of the 19th century next to the Bible. It's called Ben-Hur. In the 19th century, German higher, higher critics, my people, they had pretty much taken over all the seminaries and the academy, and they criticized the Bible in every which way you could think of. Form criticism, textual criticism, source criticism, redaction criticism, which is the work that I I did when I was doing my master's thesis. And they said, oh, everything we have today is totally corrupted. But then in 1947, there was a couple young teenage shepherd boys in the land of Israel taking care of some goats down by the Dead Sea. They were throwing some stones into a cave just for fun. But while they were doing that, they heard this clunk. They went back the next day to investigate. What they found there was astonishing. They found all these large jars with old manuscripts, and they didn't just find one cave. They found 11 different caves in the same area, all of them full of these jars with tens of thousands of manuscripts and, and fragments with scripture on them. Now, the ancient writing material used to compose much of the Bible was called papyrus. It's made from a reed found in the Nile Valley. It's pieced together much like plywood today, and then it's set out in the sun to dry. It was very cheap. So much of these manuscripts were made of papyrus. They're preserved for us, but a lot of them are very small fragments because it's very easy to break off from a longer piece. So for the Dead Sea Scrolls, some of them are these tiny little scraps, like the size of a postage stamp. But others are medium size. And then some they found in these caves were very, very large. They found a complete manuscript of the book of Isaiah, all 66 chapters, all one scroll. Considering that these documents are about 2,000 years old, that's pretty cool. Because of where they were in the desert and the dry salt air, they were preserved very well. Well, soon, as you might guess, these manuscripts ended up in the hands of scholars who began to study them. And many of them, sought to disprove the accuracy of our modern-day scriptures with them because they assumed these new documents would expose significant errors in, in the documents that we have today. But you know what they found? When you compare them side by side with what we had, it was exactly the opposite. 
all the Dead Sea Scrolls really showed us with, was that even if we move back our collection by over a thousand years earlier, the text was exactly the same. Put them side by side and you can compare and contrast and some of the Dead Sea Scrolls are actually in better shape than the stuff we had. All we learned was that the scribes did their job very well. And once again, the critics were silenced because the Bible has stood the test of time. Pastor John Lee put it this way, down through the years, the Bible has been a mighty anvil that has worn out many of the puny hammers of the scoffers. Point number five. Point number five is this, the Bible is repeatedly confirmed historically through archaeology. Now, the field of archaeology is really only a couple hundred years old, but it is a great ally to the Christian faith. There's so many examples. I could get up here and really geek out on you on archaeology, so I'm not going to do that, but I just want to give you my favorite four. So just pretend we're sitting down and you grab your cup of hot cocoa or your pumpkin spice latte, and we're going to go through a, a four-part photo album together, all right? Number one, in 1979, they discovered a small silver scroll, silver amulets. It dated to 600 BC. This was something that they would wear around their neck like jewelry. It was found during the excavation of a tomb, accidentally. There was this little kid who kept bothering the head archaeologist and pulling on his, and he said, yeah, go over there. He starts banging on the floor with a hammer. The whole floor falls through and they find all this open area and inside this open area, they find this, these silver amulets. To everyone's great surprise, they find verses of scripture inside of there and it remains the oldest piece of scripture we have to this day as it contains a portion of Numbers chapter six. The problem with that is Numbers chapter 6 wasn't supposed to exist at that time. They thought the whole Old Testament was crafted somewhere between 400 and 200 B.C. at that time, but then they find this scroll that's dated much earlier. One of my profs at, at Dallas, Dr. Eugene Merrill, said this, the ancient, the, the amulet scroll uh, disproved decades of liberal biblical studies in one small discovery. It's amazing. Another detail of ancient Israel that is widely mocked and held to be impossible was the biblical claim that King Hezekiah diverted the entire water supply of Jerusalem to provide water for the city in the time of siege warfare. But then in 1938, biblical scholar Edward Robinson shook up the archaeological world by discovering Hezekiah's tunnel, a tunnel which is 1,750 feet long, complete with ancient inscriptions explaining how the tunnel was first made. Today, it's a major tourist attraction. How many of you have you been to Israel, you've been to Hezekiah's tunnel? Yeah, lots of us. Again, testifying to the reliability of the biblical story. You can read about it in 2 Chronicles 32. Here it is. Number three, another significant point of attack against our faith was the lack of any extra biblical evidence mentioning King David. Since I was named after King David, this concerned me. They doubted the existence of David altogether. But then in 1993, we found this stone. It has text on it, and it's dated to 830 BC. It's the account of a nearby pagan king in his journals and his military operations against guess who? They're fighting against the house of David. He's fighting against Israel. Again, Dr. Merrill says this, this puts the historical existence of David beyond doubt and furthermore shows him to be so powerful a figure that the nation was named for him. Did King David exist as a powerful king during the time the Bible says he existed? Absolutely. You can't deny the facts. Facts are stubborn things, John Adams said. Number four, for a long time, people doubted the existence of Pontius Pilate. Until 1961, a group of archaeologists were excavating an ancient Roman theater in Israel, and they found this limestone block with a surprising inscription, Pontius Pilate, prefect of Judea. What's the date? First century. This verifies that Pontius Pilate really did live and he really did serve in the political role that the Bible reports he did. It's amazing. Now, there's so many more examples that I don't really have time to share, maybe another time, but many of the Bible's characters, 
and places and events have been verified. Why? Because they are grounded in real history. You compare that to other faiths. Uh, one of my professors, Dr. Gordon Johnston, shared with us that Brigham Young University actually has a hard time keeping the department chair for the archaeology department filled because they have yet to find any archaeological evidence for any of the battles or the coins or the horses or the everyday objects of life that the Book of Mormon says should be in the early Americas during the time that the, they say it happened. Compare that to the kind of corroboration we find in the ground through the spade with the sacred scriptures. My challenge for you is just look into biblical archaeology a little bit. You don't have to be a geek like me, but you can find, find out some things, and I think you'll find it to be fascinating. It's a magazine that comes every two months. You go to their website, you can even get a free trial issue. So there you go. My point is that modern archaeology repeatedly confirms the historical reliability of what the scriptures say happened actually happened. Why trust the Bible? Because of archaeology. Last point. Point number six is my favorite point to talk about. Why trust the Bible? Because the Bible has been preserved with a high degree of accuracy. Here we're talking about what's called textual transmission. Recently, I was reading Newsweek, and I came across a quote, made me want to throw the magazine across the room. The author said this, quote, no television preacher has ever read the Bible. Neither has any evangelical politician. Neither has the Pope. Neither have I. Neither have you. At best, all we've read are bad translations. A translation of translations of translations of hand-copied copies of copies of copies of copies and on and on hundreds of times. Is that true? I hear this a lot. Can we be confident that the original text of the Bible was transmitted accurately to us down through the centuries? When it comes to answering that question, you have to ask two things. Number one, how many copies of that ancient text do you have? Number two, how close are they in time to the actual events they're reporting? Now, what I'm about to acknowledge may concern some of you. It's technically true that what we have today are not the original manuscripts written by the authors themselves. That's true. All we have are copies. And keep in mind that these copies were made before modern technology. So in that environment, occasionally the process, though very, very careful and very, very meticulous, was subject to small human error at times, and those are called textual variants. Okay, please don't leave. Okay, but, 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 listen very carefully to my next statement. It's very important. 99% of those textual variants make no difference whatsoever. Let me explain by putting this chart up on the screen. Let's say this pie chart represents all the textual variants that exist today in all of our New Testament manuscripts. Now, a textual variant is just a manuscript that has any difference, including one letter missing. That's a variant. 80% of these textual variants are spelling errors. There's one letter missing or two letters switched around. One of the biggest spelling problems is how do you spell John is there two N's at the end or one N at the end? Is that a big deal? I don't think so. Every scholar, conservative or critical, knows how to easily correct those mistakes, and the text makes complete sense, no problem. Now, the 19% on the chart are copying mistakes. Again, basically insignificant. One manuscript over here might read the Lord Jesus, Another manuscript over here might read the Lord Jesus Christ. Is that a significant difference? Does that really change the meaning? No. Now keep in mind, this was before the Xerox machine. Frankly, these were written during a time period where Christians wanted to disseminate the message of the gospel as fast and as wide as they could. Often they were hearing and writing it down in the environment called a scriptorium where one person was reading out loud and eight or nine people were writing down what they heard. Obviously, some small errors could be understandable. Now we're down to the 1%. This 1%, which is acknowledged by Christians and non-Christians, textual scholars alike, are those incidences where 
it does possibly change the significance or the meaning of a verse. And whenever this happens, you usually will see a note in your English Bible explaining the difference. Uh, there's a famous example uh, that I'll just share with you. One famous example. At the end of the Gospel of Mark, some of our manuscripts end at Mark 16, verse 8, and then other copies of Mark end at Mark 16, verse 20. And to be honest with you, we're really not sure which one is the right one. Uh, did someone add the ending to make it longer? Or was that the last page in the manuscript that kind of got wore out and fell off? We actually don't know the answer to that question. That kind of thing makes up the 1%. There you go. I'm putting it out there. We're not hiding it. You can read all about it. Believe me, geeks like me love to debate about this kind of stuff. There's no secrets. But, but I really need you to listen to this next point. Here's what you really need to know. Zero percent, zero percent, zero percent of all the textual variants that we have have anything to do with any of the major doctrines of the Christian faith. Zero percent. Listen to me, there are no textual variants suggesting that Jesus was not born of a virgin. There are no textual variants suggesting Jesus didn't claim to be God. There are no textual variants claiming that Jesus didn't rise from the dead. Did you hear me? None. Everybody knows this. In fact, I'm gonna read you a quote from one of the most critical scholars out there today, Bart Ehrman. He, acknowledged, he acknowledges to what I just said. Listen to how he says it. The essential Christian beliefs are not affected by the manuscript differences in the New Testament. That is the most radical skeptic out there. Look at what he says. Even Bart Ehrman acknowledges this reality. He knows the truth that the New Testament manuscripts we have are highly reliable and highly accurate, and we have so many of them which makes it really easy to compare and contrast and deduce which reading is probably the most original. We have over 5,700 manuscripts of the New Testament. That's a lot compared to every other source of antiquity. How many of you have you've heard of the philosopher Plato? He's probably the most widely known philosopher of all time. How many ancient copies exist of Plato's writings? Remember, in the New Testament, over 5,000. For Plato, there are, can I get a drum roll please? Seven. Seven? It's kind of funny, isn't it? You know what's not funny? The double standard. Have you ever heard anyone question the reliability of Plato's writings? Me neither. You know, it's a historical fact that there are textual variants in the Quran. How come there's not a New York Times bestseller called Misquoting Muhammad? I don't know, but here's what I do know. Listen to this quote from one of my professors, Dan Wallace. The wealth of material that is available for determining the wording of the original New Testament is staggering. More than 5,700 Greek New Testament manuscripts, as many as 20,000 versions, and more than one million quotations by patristic writers? In comparison with the average ancient Greek author, the New Testament copies are well over a thousand times more plentiful. He goes on to say all the copies of the works of an average Greek author would stack up to like four feet high. Everything put together. And yet, the copies of the New Testament would stack up a mile high. This is indeed an embarrassment of riches. And isn't it like our God? To leave us a witness? That answers the number of sources we have. But how close are they to the events that they describe? We have 12 New Testament manuscripts from between 100 and 200 AD, and we have about 100 more manuscripts that date between 200 and 300 AD. After that, it just goes off the charts. And we begin to use a material in the ancient world that was called parchment much more expensive. It was made not from papyrus, it was made from the skin of sheep and goats. And it was used up until the Middle Ages when paper kind of took over. So lots of the longer pieces we have of the Bible are on parchment, like this one right here. Codex Sinaiticus is a complete copy of the whole New Testament from 330 AD. You can look at it, it's in a British museum in London. Codex Vaticanus, same thing. This is really good evidence 
that what was originally written is what we're reading today in our translations. If I could just maybe visually represent it on the stage, just imagine if there's a timeline up here and I'm standing here at ground zero during Jesus' life. Uh, the biographies that were written about Jesus' life, uh, let's say the Gospel of Mark, was probably written right here at about 50, 55 A.D. That's kind of like pretty close to the events, right? 20 years later? 20 years ago, guys, it was 1998. You guys remember some stuff from 1998? Okay, it's not that, not that long ago. Okay, now let's just compare that to someone else. Let's take, for example, if ground zero here is Alexander the Great, his life. What do you think is the oldest surviving copy of a biography of Alexander the Great? Because we know a lot about him, right? He was age 33, conquered the Grecian world. We know about his battles and all kinds of stuff. The old, the, the most, the, the copy that's closest to his life is over here, 330 years later. Does anybody ever talk about how we can question the reliability of our biographies of Alexander the Great? I don't hear them talking about that. Say, say, say we, we do Aristotle, this is ground zero, Aristotle. The, the, the copy we have of Aristotle's writings is, I'd have to go in the parking lot. It's 1,400 years after Aristotle. Does anybody ever question the reliability of Aristotle's writings? You see the double standard there? The New Testament is far superior than any other ancient work. Look at what Dr. White says. The New Testament manuscript tradition is deeper, wider, and earlier than any other relevant work of antiquity. While we have fragments of the New Testament that date to within decades of the original writings, the average classical work has a 500-year gap between its writing and its first extant manuscript evidence. Let me just give you one more example. This is a picture of the oldest New Testament fragment that has been cataloged. It's called P52. It's a portion of the Gospel of John. It's dated to 125 A.D., that's amazing. We found this in 1934. It was extremely important because in those days, the critical scholars were dating John to around 200 AD. Then they discover this fragment and it's dated to 125 AD. Critical scholars have a bit of a problem here. Here you have a copy of John's gospel, which is 100 years earlier than they said the gospel was ever written. This is a witness to the fact that this gospel was written very early. This is amazing. Now, just think about that piece of paper on the screen for a moment with me. Here is a scrap we have left of the gospel of John. It's like the size of a credit card. This piece of paper is 1,900 years old. It was copied by hand, probably at the risk of that scribe's life. During a time of severe persecution, now we have it and we can read exactly what it says. And you know what's fascinating? The words on this fragment are the same exact words in the Gospel of John right in front of you. Same words, same message, same story. This is a text which has been transmitted faithfully from generation to generation down to our day. And guess which passage in the Gospel of John it preserves? It, it's, it's a little tiny section in John 18 where Jesus is talking to Pilate. In this fragment, Jesus Christ says this, I am a king. For this purpose I was born. For this purpose I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Please forgive me if I cannot help but to see the hand of God in this incredible find. The question you have to ask is when you read this book, do you hear the voice of Jesus Christ? When you read the Bible, do you hear his voice? Why trust the Bible? Here are six really good reasons. But let me just say something a lot more personal than that. I love the evidences for the Bible, but the main reason I'm a Christian is because of the description of the main character. I find Jesus Christ to be so compelling. 
When I open this book and I read about him and I hear his teachings and I see what he did, I cannot imagine a more incredible, more perfect, more beautiful figure. He is impeccable. His teachings are brilliant. Jesus' temperament is so balanced. In his majesty, he is so high above all others, but then in his humility, he stoops lower than anyone can go. His justice is strong and unwavering, but then his mercy is lavish and quick to restore. He's always tender, but never weak. He's always bold, but never harsh. He has unbending convictions when he stands before these rulers, but then he's totally approachable as he's surrounded by little kids. He gave his life for you. That's why I believe this book. The Bible is his story. And he says, this is how you get to know me. I know you. I want you to know me. And you find out who he is in that book right there. I'm, I'm reminded of the words of the hymn. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. Which brings me to you. How about you? What will you do with this book? If this book is true, it has major implications for your life. And if this book is true, and you don't follow out those implications, there are major consequences to that decision. Imagine if you had to make an investment. Imagine if you had a sum of money, and you had to choose your investor, and someone else has the sum of money, and they have to choose their investor. Well, let's say your friend over here did really well, but, but you, you lost it all. What's the difference? The difference is the person you chose to be your advisor. I argue that your belief about the Bible is so much more important than your choice about who's going to manage your 401k. Yet many people spend so much more time on that decision than they do looking into the credibility and reliability of this book. That doesn't make any sense. Here's my question. What will you do with this book? Will you ignore it? Will you reject it? Or will you take up and read and therein find the voice and listen to the voice of your Savior. There are some more resources in your bulletin. If you want to look into this further, I encourage you to press the Bible. It can stand up to the hardest scrutiny. Worship team, would you come forward as I share one more story? I want to close today with a testimony of Craig Groeschel. Craig Groeschel, if you don't know him, was a self-described drunk frat boy in college. The fraternity that he was a part of got in a lot of trouble and was on notice. And so as a PR move, Craig Groeschel decides to start a Bible study. The problem is he didn't even own a Bible. On his way to the study, a Gideon, that organization that hands out the Bibles, hands him a copy of the New Testament, a little tiny green soft cover. It was through that Bible, Groeschel said, God's living word, that he and the rest of his fraternity brothers trusted in Christ. Craig is now the pastor of the second largest church in America with over 26,000 members. They are on the cutting edge of technology and ministry. And when it came time for them to develop the YouVersion Bible app, it was suggested to Craig that he charge 99 cents as is cost, custom for many Bible apps. But he said this, no, I received my first Gideon Bible for free. I will never charge anyone to download it. His app is now the most popular Bible app available with over 60 million downloads. Friends, there is an astonishing amount of support which testifies to the reliability of the scriptures. It far exceeds the reliability of any other ancient book in history. From stone carvings to early papyrus, to the printing press, to now digital media and the Bible app.
The Bible has been transmitted to us faithfully from generation to generation because it is not just words on a page. It is the very word of the living God which gives hope and life to a dying world. Can you trust the Bible? Yes, without question. The grass withers. The flowers fade. The word of our God stands forever.